That's a lovely scene. Hopefully that's helping to make everybody feel more relaxed. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this short little info session uh, where we're going to be chatting about when is anxiety a problem and when is it just normal day-to-day -day worrying and when is it something to be taken a little bit more seriously. Um, so I'm hoping that this is going to be a bit of an interactive session. I don't want to do this as a lecture. This is certainly not my intention is to just lecture and put up PowerPoint presentation and just blah, blah, blah. I'm hoping that you're watching this because either you are struggling with anxiety or you know of somebody who's struggling with anxiety or you have a child who's struggling with anxiety. I mean, let's face it, we are all on this corona coaster this year and anxiety is definitely, um, it's either going to be a friend or a foe. Uh, so yeah, we're here to just chat about it and to um, really hopefully you can uh, take some things away from here and hopefully share what you've learned with others. Um, so yes, I think um, my first question, if there is anybody watching, to just tell me how have you felt this year? Have you had feelings of feeling overwhelmed, anxious, um, being uh, confused, um, exhausted, worried? There's so many uncertainties at the moment. Everybody's thinking about Christmas. Oh my gosh, where are we going to spend Christmas this year? Um, are the infections going to spike? Are schools going to close again? Is my child going to be able to write exams? Um, all those kind of things are, are causing such uh, uncertainty and anxiety. Um, so yeah, I'm here. I'm really here as, as a human being, number one. A human being with feelings and emotions. And yes, one of them is anxiety. I'm a parent. I'm a teacher. I've seen anxiety in children. I have heard parents speak about their children with anxiety. I have coached parents. I have listened to um, children speak about how school has uh, made them feel so anxious and worried and they don't want to go to school and all these kind of things. And I'm really wanting to throw some light on this issue because I think anxiety is something that we don't talk about. Um, we hide it away like a secret friend. We don't want anybody to know that we have a secret friend called anxiety. And that's why I called this talk um, anxiety friend or foe because it can be uh, somebody who monopolizes your time, who takes over everything that you do, um, who, like a jealous partner, you know, it's somebody that you always have to consult before you make any decisions. You always got to think about how you're going to manage your anxiety during this time or during something that you have to do. So yes, my name is Philippa Fabri. I'm an education consultant and my, my, uh, I'm reaching out to parents to, to, Really chat to your children, listen to your children, listen to yourself, listen to your spouse, listen to what is going on. And hopefully you're going to hear something now that might just um, strike a chord with you or you might notice something that you never thought of before. So, yeah, let's start off with um, the, the slides. And like I said, this is not a PowerPoint presentation that I'm wanting everybody to just uh, statically watch and um, um, and get bored like uh, at varsity where you didn't really um, feel like you were part of the class. This is something that I'm wanting comments, I'm wanting questions, um, and I want you to really interact with me so we can um, have a great time together. So yes, if we look at anxiety and what anxiety could look like, everybody deals with anxiety in a different way. Um, and this year, especially because of what COVID has brought to us, parents are looking for something different. Uh, traditional school might not be for everybody, and we are seeing this. We're seeing this increase in the amount of online schools that have um, appeared in our country, and parents are looking at them really seriously in terms of what they can offer for my child because traditional schooling might just not be for my child for whatever reason. It could be that it's too competitive. It could be that it's too fast. It could be that it's just too big. Um, it could be that your child might have a learning challenge and the school just isn't able to to assist. So there are, there are many reasons why parents might look at something different for their children. So when we look at anxiety and we look at the stats, it's quite alarming. Um, you look at 8 to 11 percent of children and adolescents suffer from anxiety. Uh, these stats I've got from the South African um, the South African Anxiety and Depression Group, SADAG, S-A-D-A-G. I've included their um, website in the resource at the end. 
One in five people, 50% more common in females, and as many as 80% do not go for treatment or do not get um, diagnosed. We know that it runs in families. I'll chat about that in a minute. And we look at the normal versus abnormal. When is anxiety normal? When is it not? And when are your fears rational and when are they ir irrational? So again, we will come and we'll chat about those next. We're looking at the type of anxiety disorders. And look, I just um, put this little picture in because it's actually quite sweet. In terms of when the child starts school, um, the child doesn't want to leave the mother. And then when the child starts varsity, the mother doesn't want to leave the child. So um, maybe if we could just put that comment down there, I'm going to get to the comment in a minute, but I just wanted to have a look at the different causes of anxiety. I need to get out of the way. So you have separation anxiety, which normally disappears as soon as the child starts school. So separation anxiety is very much part of the child's life when they're little. Um, they don't really want to go anywhere without mommy or daddy. They like to have that attachment to mom and dad. Um, and you'd hope that when they start school, that separation anxiety disappears. Specific phobias, we all know about uh, arachnophobia or fear of the dark or fear of tight spaces, things like that. Those are specific phobias. General anxiety disorder, where you just worry about everything and, and anything all the time. Social anxiety is where you prefer your own company. You don't really like big crowds. You prefer not to have to go to busy shopping centers and that sort of thing. And then your panic disorder or your agoraphobia, which is more common in your older child, the teenage and the, the adults. So let's quickly look at um, what we might see. So parents, this is where you might see um, different kinds of behaviors. This is what you would see at the top of the iceberg. Well, the iceberg that you see outside of the water, you would see things like anger, lack of focus, sleep issues, defiance, being over planning, um, negativity, avoidance, that kind of thing. Whereas what's going on underneath the surface are those feelings that are not so obvious. Um, they are more internal, um, internalized feelings. The, the behavior would be externalized feelings and the feelings underneath the surface would be internalized feelings that are noticed or not always noticed, but that are there. Um, looking at other mental illnesses that could also be, um, that might also co occur with anxiety would be things like eating disorders, mood disorders, depression, psychotic disorders, etc. But I'm not going to go into too much of that right now. All right, so let's look at the various causes of anxiety. So there are three main causes. The biopsychosocial model talks about three types of, uh, or the three factors Biological causes are those that are internal. Again, these are caused or these are because of the body's makeup. Genes, we normally say anxiety, could be um, hereditary. Some children are more predisposed to anxiety because of their genetic makeup um, and the, 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 family, the family, sort of the hereditary factor. Psychological causes, we look at post-traumatic stress syndrome or something that has occurred in the past. Now here again, we're looking at an external factor, something that happened outside of the child's um, body. The environmental causes or the social causes could be something that, um, again, is external, um, where they possibly see a parent being very anxious or how the parent behaves is how the child will behave because of what they have noticed or what has been around and um, the environment that the child has grown up in um, has a, has, plays a big role there. All right, sure, we are racing through this. Can I just have that question again there? I have seen the anxiety in my students and my son. I have also felt anxiety about the future. Yeah, Nick, I think that is common. I think we are all seeing anxiety in our students and our own children and um, feel quite helpless at times because, you know, you can talk and you can try and be encouraging and you can try and be positive and optimistic. But at the end of the day, the anxieties are real. They are living in the exact same world that we are living in. They just don't always have the mechanisms, the coping mechanisms that we have. We've been around a lot longer, so we have more, um, we have more water that's flown under the bridge, I suppose, to deal with anxiety. But our children are living in that same COVID at the moment. Um, they're on the same corona coaster as we are, we, are, we are on. And so it's quite natural that children are anxious, especially... Um, worrying about, you know, what's going to happen, um, you know, is there going to be another 
um, lockdown? Am I going to be able to write exams? What's going to happen next year? Am I going to have a matric dance and all those kind of things? It must be a, a, a very um, difficult situation to be in, especially for our matrics. I think we should really think of them at this at this point. So yes, um, we can, we can look at um, the anxiety also on a almost on a on a on a seesaw. Um, the positive emotions is where you're feeling up and happy and jo jovial and full of joy. Negative emotions, you're feeling like you're carrying the world on your shoulders. Um, so normal anxiety, when you are feeling positive and we're, life's going great and you're optimistic and everything's going fantastically well, um, normal anxiety you can manage. You know, Normal anxiety would be things like, um, I've got to go and write an exam or I've got to go to the doctor or I've got to go and do a presentation in front of a group of people. That would be normal anxiety and worry. Quite normal. As soon as the event is over, then that anxiety goes away. Abnormal anxiety, though, on the other side of the spectrum would be something that is with you all the time. Um, it affects your life. It affects every decision that you've made that you have to make. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of make decisions when you have this hanging over your head all the time. Um, and your body is flooded with cortisol all the time, which I'm going to speak about just now. So cortisol is that um, hormone that is released in your body when you become anxious. Looking at um, what research says as well, um, and looking at what is the best kind of, I suppose, treatment for anxiety, they talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, the CBT, which is the gold standard for treatment for anxiety. Um, and if you look at, I'm sure you've heard of CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, it always involves some kind of exposure. So if you talk about an anxiety provoking situation, that could be, let's say, for example, um, you are scared of heights. So you are scared of heights and now you've got, to cross, you've got to cross over a bridge. So that is the anxiety provoking situation. You've got to cross over a high bridge. So what happens? All of a sudden, the physiological things start happening in your body. You have the increased heart rate. You feel, you feel tense, you, fl you flush or blush, you have sweatiness, you're dizzy, um, you might have nausea. Those are the physiological um, things that are happening. And because of those things happening, the emotions are all of a sudden feeling panicky, I'm dreading it, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, um, I'm sad because I have those emotions. So the physiological and the emotional play against each other. Now on the other side, the cognitive is saying, Okay, what if I go across that bridge and I have a panic attack and I, um, my heart stops beating? Or what happens if the bridge falls and I um, collapse? Or So you start to worry, you start to think about worst case scenarios and all kinds of things that could go wrong. And then the behavioral is how to deal with what's going on. What is going, how to deal with the physiological issues that are going on in your body, the emotional issues that are going on in your body, and the cognitive issues that are going on in your head. Your behavior is going to be very much what your behavior will, will um, detect what is the outcome going to be. So if those physiological issues carry on and you, st and you acknowledge them and you say, okay, I'm feeling a bit dizzy or okay, I'm feeling my heart is beating fast or okay, I'm feeling um, sweaty. And you know why you're feeling like that. Because you know, okay, it's because I have to walk across the bridge. So what can you do? You can either not walk across the bridge and rather do something else or not go across the bridge. Or you can go across the bridge and just know that it's going to be okay. I'm going to get to the other side. It's okay. I have those feelings. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's normal to feel scared. Da, da, da. And you get across the bridge. And every time you do something like that, you face your fears, it gets easier and easier and easier, which is what exposure is all about. To try and expose the person um, to those fear-invoking uh, situations so that they can be better able to deal with their, their further worries and concerns. So that is CBT. So I'm not too sure um, if, if parents are aware that CBT works just as well with children as well. Um, sometimes children are not able to speak about their anxieties or they're not able to talk about the things that they worry about. But a good therapist can generally still speak, sort of get the information from the child in terms of how they play or in, in terms of how they um, just chat about things that are going on in their lives without sort of needing to tell me how you're feeling, tell me how you felt about this, tell me how you felt about that. So in the same breath, parents, you need to know that your children, like I said before, your children are living in the exact same world as we are. 
they will just not be as competent to deal with the stresses of the world that we are dealing with and that we are able to deal with. Um, so some of the, the symptoms that or some of the other issues that might co-occur with anxiety would be things like depression, ADHD, um, autism spectrum disorder, Tourette's, etc., etc. Often a child might present as if they have ADHD, but it's actually anxiety that's causing the ADHD symptom. Same as a child might present with depression, but they're actually underlying, they have an underlying anxiety um, condition. So these are all kinds of things that are sometimes um, mistreated or misdiagnosed. A child will be given um, a medication to treat ADHD, but it just ex exacerbates the anxiety because we are not dealing, we're not treating the right thing. So how do you deal with stress and worry? If we think about parents and you think about a, a man versus a, a female and how they deal with anxiety, it is going to be very different. Um, how a female deals with anxiety and how a, uh, how a dad deals with anxiety. Um, we look at, again, how girls and boys are very, very different. We talk about the adults or the caregiver or the teacher who plays the most important role in detection. So this, is, this would be the adult that spends the most time with the child. Um, and again, education is key. So if you, are, um, if you are faced with a child who could potentially be anxious or they are displaying symptoms of anxiety, as a teacher, you really do need to read up and go and research what childhood anxiety might look like because their behavior might be interpreted as manipulative, naughty, or rude, whereas in fact all they are is they're just trying to avoid what they are needing to do. Just like I said with the bridge, um, if a child becomes anxious because they have to read aloud, for example, or they might become anxious because they have to do maths, and they really are struggling with that particular subject. So because they are being faced with a potential phobia or a potential anxiety provoked provoking situation, they would then become manip manipulative or they might become defiant or they might become rude and cheeky or they might run out of the classroom. They might always want to go to the toilet when it's about when it's time to start reading or whatever. Those are externalizing behaviors, which I mentioned before, the acting out behaviors. These are the behaviors that are, are easy to spot. Um, so you immediately think that child is just rude, that child is just naughty, that child is just cheeky. But why are they behaving like that? There's always a reason for it um, in terms of, and it's always the boys, by the way. Boys are better able to act out their behaviors. They might be more external in terms of how they deal with anxiety. Girls, on the other hand, they internalize. So we look at the withdrawal, the depression. They become very withdrawn. Um, girls become quiet. They, they don't tend to have those kind of manipulative, rude, or naughty behaviors. It just depends on the child, obviously. Um, and we can either fight. So again, fight, become manipulative, become rude, um, not want to do it. Freeze, where they, get, they become withdrawn or depressed, or they just stop and they don't know what to do. Or flight, where they want to just run out of the classroom, or they just want to disappear, and they want to just sort of put their head down and not want to do anything. So as teachers or as adults, our parents, we've got to identify what are the triggers that cause the behavior. So what are the things that your child is going to avoid? What are the things that your child is going to, um, what is the, the anxiety provoking situation? You've got to try and identify what those triggers are and then discuss them, you know. Say, okay, what is it? Why do you become like that when this happens? Or when, we, when I say we're going to go to the shops and we're going to go to the mall, why do you become, um, you know, irritable and cheeky and whatever? So let's try and identify what is the, what is the actual issue here. Um, we quickly we spoke about um, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy, but we can also look, about, look at things that we can do ourselves um, in terms of visiting your GP or a psychiatrist or a psychologist for children, your school counselor, registered counselor. Let's look at who can help you to deal with the issues that are going on. Who is the person that you feel the most comfortable with to talk and, 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 and open up? Medication is just one of 
the treatment options. Medication is just one. And again, when I say medication, I'm also referring to supplements. But again, it needs to be research-based medication or research-based supplements. It can't just be something that, um, you know, snake oil. You call it snake oil? Or what do you call the sort of something that is, that is just the, the most... Um, what everybody's talking about, so it must work, because everybody's talking about it, so it must work. No, it has to be something that has been researched, that's scientifically based, um, and, and that you know it, it, is, it has helped people. The one thing about anxiety, the one positive thing about anxiety, is that it is very, very treatable. And 90% um, of, of people who go on to medication for anxiety are treated uh, successfully. Uh, psychotherapy, we spoke about, CBT, um, and then self-treatment, things like exercise. When you are anxious, that cortisol um, is in excess in your body. That cortisol makes you feel quite stressed. Um, it can cause physiological issues, like I said, the racing heartbeat. You won't be able to sleep nicely. Um, you might get headaches, muscle aches and pains, all kinds of things like that could be because of excess cortisol in your body. The best way to use up this excess cortisol would be to exercise. So go for a brisk walk, go for a run, go to the gym, go and pick up weights, go and do yoga, anything like that that's going to use up that excess cortisol. That is going to really, really help. Um, so like I said, exercise, 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 medication. If you, are, um, if you are that way inclined, obviously prescribed by a proper physician and managed properly. Um, and usually they like to use medication, doctors or, or psychiatrists like to use medication if they are going to be causing you to be exposed to whatever you are um, anxious about. So the exposure, the medication usually helps you to be able to deal with the exposure a lot easier. So the good, the bad and the ugly, and please feel free to pop in questions. I'm going very, very fast, but um, I know that everybody's pressed for time. And if you have any questions for me or any comments, please pop them into the, the comments there. Um, so the, the good thing about anxiety is that it is the most treatable of all the mental illnesses. It is the most treatable and treating, treating it, it means that it's going to be your, your treatment will be successful. But if not treated, that's the bad. It can have a devastating effect on a person's life. It can really, um, like I said, like a jealous partner. It can, it can honestly, um, it can manage, try and manage your life and take over all the decisions that you have to make. I've said there it's very persistent. It has a very loud voice. Um, and often, especially with children, we need to have an integrated treatment or management system between school, home, and whoever's treating the child, whether it's a psychologist or a therapist or um, a pediatrician or a doctor. We need to have that three-tiered um, model, school, home, and whoever's, whoever's doing the treatment or whoever's dishing out the treatment. Um, so parents, what you can do, I think in terms of making sure that you get the right support, which is why um, I wanted to do this talk specifically, because um, you know there are certain things that we cannot control and there are certain things that we can control. So what can we control? We can control where our child goes to school. We can control what kind of support we put in place for our child. Making sure that they are, if they, if they prefer a smaller school environment, that we look for that. If they prefer working, um, you know, online on their own, we can certainly put that into place. Uh, making sure that, again, you build on their self-esteem and you focus on their strengths. You know, you have to look at what is my child good at, what gives my child self-confidence, what gives them that boost, what gives them that positive reinforcement. And let's make sure that we do that and give them those opportunities on a regular basis. Looking for subtle signs, I need to get out of the way. Looking for subtle signs and investigate the causes. So if you are finding that your child wakes up in the morning and their tummy is sore, or on a Sunday night when they know it's Monday the next morning, their behavior changes. Um, or like I said, when you are going to the shopping mall and there's going to be a lot of people, lots of stimul stim stimulations, they become, they act up or they... They don't enjoy it. So look at what are the causes, what are the signs that causes those triggers, that triggers those anxiety attacks or those behaviors. And then looking at what's happening in the classroom. So some children like stress balls. We like stress balls. Anything that you feel that you could, like a fidget, fidget um, toy or anything like that, a bouncy ball, anything that helps you to feel grounded or helps you to deal with your anxiety. 
Um, everybody's different. Everybody deals with things in a completely different way. So yes, um, some more information or things that you can investigate and look at. Um, those are very, very good websites. I spoke about SADAG already, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Um, the mighty.com, understood.org, and attitudemag.com. They're brilliant resources for um, understanding ADHD, mental health, um, anything to do with schooling, learning, parenting. Um, please go and have a look at those resources. And then I've just popped my email address in there as well. If you would like to send me a specific email or ask me anything specific, philippafab at gmail.com or my Facebook page, which is um, Classroom Support. So yeah, that's really me. Um, are, there any, are there any questions or comments? Um, I'd love to have a, a question or I can see there are a couple of people still online. Um, I also wanted to chat about my own personal situation, but I think what I'll do is I'm going to just pop something onto my page in terms of where I came from. And um, I said earlier that I, I had major transition anxiety um, as a little girl at school. Every time there was going to be a new teacher at the end of the year, and I knew I was going to the next grade and I had a new teacher, I would get the most horrendous stomach aches um, and I wouldn't want to go to school. Um, and my poor parents had to deal with me on the first day of every year, um, of every school year, I didn't want to go to school. And it carried on right up until um, university when I had to go to university and attend university and I didn't know where any of the classes were and I didn't know who my lectures were, I still had anxiety then. And it actually just carried on, carried on, carried on until I realized I actually needed to do something about it. Um, and, and that is what I did. So yeah, Fatima, thank you very much. Very informative. You are very, very welcome. Saj Say Saida, is it Saida? Thank you for discussing this issue. How do you help a child when they can't stop focusing on their anxiety to the point where they can't focus on their work? I think that is very, very common. Um, they hyper-focus on their anxiety and it literally does cloud everything. Um, they can't focus on their work. They can't focus on anything. Um, and it becomes something that they obsess about and they ruminate on it. Um, and that, that is where you really do need to talk about it and, and try and get some, some help. Um, I know some children, the more you talk about it to them, the worse it gets and they become so hyper-focused on, on their anxiety and they can't move on. They really can't move on. It, it comes into every conversation. And they talk about it all the time. Um, so it's very important that you do try and get help, I think, um, especially if it's becoming an issue where they are, you know, uh, they really do obsess about the fact that they're anxious. But again, there must be a reason for it. So let's try and find out what it is. If it's a general anxiety disorder where they're just generally anxious about everything. So in terms of things like they're worried about um, if there's a storm, they worry about a storm coming in and blowing the house over and mom and dad, you know, and us all dying in, in a storm or worrying about going on a car trip and what happens if we go on a car trip and we, you have an accident. So every little thing that they try and do, there's always, you know, but what if this and what if that? Um, they, they struggle to see um, anything. They struggle to see beyond their anxiety. And Nick, you're very welcome. Um, I know that you're an online tutor and you tutor English, um, second language English and home language English. So we must really chat. Um, I do would like, I would like to... Um, to know a little bit more about what you do um but thanks for for watching and yeah i think that's that's a wrap uh, next week i've been asked to talk about adhd um adults particularly adults with adhd because children with adhd and adults with adhd very very different um and the the latest uh, diagnosis from the dsm-5 about adult ADHD um, has changed and I would like to speak about that um, next week so you can tune in next Wednesday at Hoppers 8 we'll be talking about adult ADHD so please pop onto my page uh, Philippa Fabry Education Consultant it's um, forward slash classroom support um, and I'd love to I'd love to be able to help you send me an email if you'd like some help with your child if you'd like to have a private consultation with me an online consultation you are very very welcome to get hold of me is there always a cause or trigger that can or can symptoms come out of the blue? Jackie, we spoke about the three causes of anxiety. So we say that usually um, there are three possible reasons why a child is anxious. The first one has to do with their genetic makeup, you know, the nurture or nature. 
So some children are just predisposed to um, developing anxiety because it, it's in the family. So anxiety does run in families. They have a predisposition for it. They're more prone to develop anxiety. Um, then if there's a psycho, psycho issue where they may have experienced something that is an anx, 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 anxiety provoked provoking incident let's say um you're out walking at the park and a dog comes up and um growls at your child or might want to bite your child or something like that they will possibly develop a fear of dogs because of that particular traumatic experience that they had with that dog so that is something that's external something that has to do with an experience or the environment um, the other issue has to do with their, um, their family situation and how they observe mom and dad and the adults around them dealing with anxiety. So if they see mom or dad being very anxious and talking about all kinds of worrying things and, and how they behave and, and how they um, deal with anxiety, they will copy what mom and dad is doing. Um, and, and that is really, those are the three, the three main causes of anxiety, the biopsychosocial um, model. Um, so there's three sort of three causes in one. Um, so yes, are there any other questions before we say good night? I didn't want to keep you too long, um, but I think this was a very important chat, and I hope you'll share this with others. Um, and like I said, please contact me if you'd like to have a one-on-one, -on -one or if you would like to know more. It's it's something that really is very close to my heart. Um, anxiety has had to become my friend used to be my foe but it is it is now my friend so I was actually joking to my husband because this the background I don't know if can they see the background of this island this beautiful beautiful island and and I said to, to my husband um, I said yo that this island it looks so lovely I'd love to go to this island and then I thought no but if I have to go to this island that means I've got to get in an airplane and I have such a phobia of, t of, of, of small spaces so I would not, I don't like flying because you can't escape from an airplane. So I have an issue with uh, flying. So I would not be able to get on an airplane and go to that island, no matter how wonderful it might look. If it's Mauritius or wherever it is, the Seychelles, it might look like an amazing place to go to, but I would have to first get onto an airplane before I could go there. So unfortunately, I'm still dealing with anxiety every single day. So yes. Thanks, Jackie. You missed the start. It's fine. You can rewatch it. It's going to stay on my page. It'll stay on my page forever. All right. Last chance. Any specific questions? Anything? All right. So don't forget next Wednesday, half past eight. We're going to talk about adults with, adults with ADHD or ADHD in adults and how it presents and how you can uh, live with ADHD. And today we've spoken about anxiety. And I hope as adults, if you're struggling with anxiety, you're not alone. You are not alone, but it's just a matter of knowing that you have it, making friends with it, and then making sure that it doesn't take over your life. Don't let it be that jealous partner. It must be, anxiety must be something that you can comfortably live with. At least we have the background. Yes, I have had lots of notes, but I hardly looked at them. Okay, so we are, we are um, just past half past. I'm going to say good night. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you'll join me next Wednesday at half past eight. Please share this with other people. And I really, really appreciate you watching tonight. All the best. Thanks. Goodbye.